All right. Well, thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. Yes, I'm, I'm Robert Moss. I'm a class of 92. So, um, and I am down in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. And I've been here for, gosh, over 20 years now. Hard to, hard to believe. Um, and uh, writing about food and, and, and beverages. Our, uh, I'm the contributing barbecue editor for Southern Living uh, Magazine, which is a lot of fun. You write about barbecue. And I'm the restaurant critic for the Post and Courier down here. And then have written quite a number of, uh, of books over the years, um, mostly food history, including the one we're talking about today, which is Southern Spirits. And uh, my most recent book, which I uh, just came out last year, which is called The Lost Southern Chefs, they sort of overlap a little bit. Um, the Southern Spirits covers the booze side of the, of the world, whereas The Lost Southern Chefs covers more the food side, but there is actually a lot of overlap between those two. So I do have a little bit of a presentation here, um, which I'll pop up on the screen. Can you guys see the, the book covers? Okay. So, um, you know, it's, you really got a lot of pictures. I, I, th I think the talk goes better with pictures. Um, feel free to jump in and, you know, ask questions, make a dialogue. Yeah, I don't really want to do a, do a full lecture. But um, I do want to, you know, Justin asked me to talk about Southern Spirits, um, which came out a couple years ago. I think it was 2016 or 17. Um, and I've gone back and forth. I have a couple different talks that I do from it. But one, I, I sort of call the history of American cocktails in three, maybe four, maybe five glasses, depending upon how, how you count them. So I try to use drink to tell that. Uh, then I have a little more, uh, you know, a little more sensational secrets of the mint julep and the, the Sazerac revealed. But really what I thought would, would be a good a good way to do it was talk about the, the, you know, these two classic cocktails, the mint julep and the Sazerac. Because in telling the stories of how those came to be the way we know them today, you sort of actually learn the whole history of of cocktails, or you, you can you can touch on the whole history of cocktails in in the United States. And the United States is where the cocktail was originated and invented. Uh, it is one of our contributions to the world. Uh, Europe has their wine and their brandies, but uh, the, the Americans early on mastered the cocktail and introduced that to Europe. So I'll start with uh, Commander's Palace. The first time I was in New Orleans many moons ago with my wife, we went to Commander's Palace, had a beautiful uh, long afternoon lunch there as, as one should, but we ordered a, a Sazerac and the waiter brought it out to us and said, you know, here, enjoy America's original cocktail and you know, invented here in, in New Orleans. And it looks a little something like this. If you ever been to New Orleans, it has, has a uh, Sazerac. And then there's a the mint julep. I think everybody sort of has their, you know, you know, sort of knows what mint, mint julep is, right? It's in the silver cup. It's made of bourbon uh, and sugar and mint. Uh, it's something you, you get in Kentucky in particular at the, uh, uh, particularly at the Kentucky Derby. And I wrote an entire book that basically says, uh, none of that stuff is, is really true. At least, yes, it is associated with uh, Kentucky today, but originally the julep was not a bourbon drink. It was not associated with Kentucky early on. So, uh, you know, in Southern Spirits, I talk a lot about how, these great cocktails came to be. Um, Eater, a while back, back in 2015, he ran this expose. Surprise, the Kentucky Derby hasn't sold real mint juleps in 18 years. Why haven't they sold real mint juleps? But what they say is that starting back in the 90s or something, uh, Churchill Downs started making their mint juleps with early times, which is a Kentucky whiskey, not bourbon, because with the rules the federal rules for bourbon, it has to be aged in a new charred, charred oak barrel for at least two years. Early times is aged in used uh, oak barrels. So it has to be sold as Kentucky whiskey, not as, as bourbon. Um, but I don't think that's all that scandal scandalous, uh, but I think it's telling that for either at least and many others, a real mint julep has to be made with bourbon, not with, not with whiskey. Uh, I'd say not exactly. Uh, so we'll we'll dig into that a little bit. So both the julep and the cocktail, you can trace them back to the toddy, which is also known as the sling, uh, which is one of the original ways of of drinking booze uh, back in the as far back as the colonial days. Um, so we we say toddy. We're not talking about a hot toddy with a lot of spices and and orange that you might you might enjoy during the winter. We say sling. We're not talking about like the um, the gin sling on the left there, or the or the pink Singapore sling on the right. These really sweet fruity uh, drinks that you can get today. Originally, a toddy or a sling uh, was a simple combination: spirit, sugar, and water. And the thing to remember is, in the late 18th century or 19th century, 
spirits were really rough. They really weren't barrel aged at that point. They were pretty fresh off the still. They were harsh with all the impurities that, that, that came off the still that later uh, American distillers introduced barrel aging to help take out. So you really didn't want to just drink your rum or your brandy or your, your corn whiskey straight. You wanted to mix it with something to cut it. And sugar was the, the original way you would do it. Um, but when you're talking about sugar, we're not talking about white sugar like these uh, Damu uh, sugar cubes that we think of today. Sugar back in the, uh, really straight through the most of the 19th century was a much different product than it is today. There was no white sugar. Um, did you you had uh, you know the, the sugar refinement process was taking basically the cane from uh, you know the juice from the sugar cane, boiling it down. But it was filled with impurities. It was filled with molasses, uh, you know, the thick dark uh, matter, and they would basically let it strain out and purify it. But still, most sugar that people used in the 19th century is what you see on the left here, which was called uh, lump sugar or sometimes cone, a sugar cone. But it was actually molded into these cones and it's dark brown in color because like, like brown sugar uh, today, it has lots of molasses in it. Uh, and it was much, you know, this was the, the, the purest sugar you could get. Uh, up on the upper right, you had to take that cone and you, you would have these sugar knives or pinchers that you would actually take and you know cut off a big piece of that uh that sugar so if you're making a toddy you need one of these things down on the right which i have a similar one here which is a toddy stick or a muddler and you would take that lump of sort of you know rich sugar put a little water on it and then crush it well with the with the uh the muddler to sort of make a uh you know a little bit of a syrup out of it and then pour your liquor over it and, and drink it. Um, so when I talk to people today about making 19th century cocktails, uh, sugar today is much more refined. They can get all the molasses out and become you know, pure crystalline white sugar. But I, I recommend using for 19th century recipe, recipes, at least, if, especially things that you're using whiskey or dark liquors, either Demerar or Turbinado sugar, which is easy to find. Uh, it's just in the grocery store aisle here in you know, my Aristide or my Publix. Uh, both carry it. And I use that for a lot of old cocktails. You can still make syrup the way they did in the old days, which is take either a sugar cube, and you can actually buy Demerara cubes, but you usually have to order them. I don't usually see those in the, in the grocery store. But you can either, either take like equal parts of the sugar, like a teaspoon of sugar, a teaspoon of water, two teaspoons, two teaspoons, mix it together until it dissolves in the glass if you want. Uh, I tend to take the easier way out, trying to work uh, smarter, not harder and make a simple syrup out of it. And it's simple as can be. It's why they you know, call it simple syrup. Here's my Demerara simple syrup. It's, I usually use a cup of Demerara sugar, cup of water, put it in a pan on the stove, boil it till the sugar dissolves. And it's, and then I pour it in a little squeeze bottle. It saves me a lot of muddling and grinding, though I can I can muddle and grind if, if I need to. So that's one of my tips for historical cocktail creation. It has, a, it like, it has, it has much more of that molasses brown sugar type flavor in it. Um, than, than white sugar does. I would use white sugar for something like a, a gin cocktail, something that's very light and fruity, but if it's something that's sort of dark and boozy, I tend to go with uh, the Demerara. So it's called a toddy or a sling. Uh, which one is it? Um, the cocktail <laughs> historian uh, and a friend of mine, David Wondrich, wrote memorably that in the 19th century, the toddy was a cold, a warm cocktail that, or a warm drink that was sometimes served cold while the sling was a cold drink that was sometimes served warm. So I think that that uh, that clears it up nicely. Um, important thing to note, and we'll talk about ice in a minute. When we say it was served cold, that means room temperature. That means in the South, it may well be 75, 80 degrees uh, in the 19th century because you know it, it, there's, there's no air conditioning, there's no ice available uh, to cool it down. So a, even a cool or a, a, a cold toddy would actually be you know, a room temperature toddy, uh, whatever your room temperature was, depending on where you were. So that's sort of the 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 origin, the the uh, the original uh, original form of mixed drink, something other than just just the raw spirits. And then the julep and the cocktail both descended from the toddy. They are, they are both variations of the toddy. So we'll start with the original julep. So we think about the that big old uh, icy goblet. Not exactly how the julep started out. So these are two um, 
passages from, from uh, the late 1800s, 1789 and 1784, from travelers in Virginia who talk about the at the Virginia planter rises about eight o'clock, drinks what he calls a julep, which is a large glass of rum sweetened with sugar, and then walks or more generally rides. The one on the right, uh, similar uh, julep made of rum, water, and sugar. So the original juleps were actually just just rum and sugar. Um, rum was the most popular, most common spirit in the in the in the colonial America, and even right after the revolution um, until the domestic uh, whiskey industry started in the 19th or really got going in the 19th century. So julep was originally not made with with rum. It was or with uh, bourbon or whiskey. It was made with rum. Um, these early versions are just rum, sugar, and water. But somewhere along the way, the line around 1800, a little mint started sneaking into the glass. And uh, this is a, another travel log from 1803 uh, talking about a, you know, a Virginia planter. The first thing he did uh, on getting out of bed was call for a julep. And he had a little footnote that says a dram of spiritus liquor that, spiritus liquor that has mint steeped in it, taken by Virginians of a morning. So the original julep would be you know, just add to the formula, spirit, sugar, water, and then add in a little bit of mint, and you had a julep. The name actually comes from an Arabic word for julab, which was sort of a medicinal term. So it was sort of a medicinal compound. Uh, in fact, it's called an antifogmatic by a lot of uh, Virginians, meaning it helps cut the fog in the morning. So it was a, a morning tipple, sort of in the medicinal world. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the original julep back in the early 19th century. All right, as for the original cocktail, uh, which today, um, you know, we use the cocktail to refer to just a generic term for a mixed drink. Back then, uh, it was a very specific drink. There is a story you may read or hear that the name actually came from New Orleans from a pharmacist named A.A. Pecho, who we'll get to in a, in a moment who uh, made his own brand of bitters, but he would serve uh, a, his bittered slings and his, or his bittered toddies in a uh, egg-shaped cup called a cockate, which was the, you know, the French name for it, which uh, was corrupted by the English speakers in New Orleans into cocktail. Um, this is not true. <laughs> this was uh, a story that it, it made the rounds. Um, but the problem was uh, back in 1806, when A.A. A. Peychaud was about three years old, um, this uh, article appeared in the Columbia or the, the Balance and Columbian Repository, a newspaper up in, in Hudson, New York. It says cocktail is a uh, stimulating liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. It is but vulgarly called a bittered sling. So if you take a sling, add some bitters to it. Uh, and you have cocktail. Uh, this is from 1845, um, a travel log from a guy who went and visited New Orleans and, and wrote a, uh, a book called New Orleans as I found it. And he explained the difference between a brandy cocktail and a brandy toddy is that the brandy toddy, you mix together water, sugar, and brandy. Uh, brandy cocktails, the same ingredients with the addition of a shade of Stoughton's bitters. So it's bitters, but he specifies a, a specific brand. And in fact, Stoughton's Bitters was the first really popular brand of bitters uh, in both England, where it was it was created, and in the uh, United States. Uh, Stoughton created and marketed in England, but didn't have uh, any kind of rights to it in the United States. So lots of people in the United States made what they called Stoughton's Bitters, but it was their version of his recipe. And you can find it sold throughout the, the throughout the South. Originally, bitters were largely a medicinal a medicine. It was, you know, alcohol steeped with herbs. It would help stomach, it help uh, settle your stomach, do a lot of other, you know, supposed wonderful things for your, your constitution. Somewhere along the line, people realized that you sneak it into a toddy, it actually makes it makes it pretty, uh, pretty tasty as well. And so bitters moved over. There's some other examples of ads for Stoughton, but bitters you would see throughout the 19th century. It turns out that it's really a... Um, you know, find in a cocktail, even if you're, you know, nothing is ailing you. And bitters pretty quickly became a part of the American uh, repertoire, and it's particularly as a cocktail. So back to our math, spirit, sugar, water, bitters, add them together and, and you get cocktail. It's the name of a very specific drink. 
Now, over time, bartenders started getting creative and started putting other things into a cocktail. Uh, this is actually um, a, two pages from Jerry Thomas's How to Mix Drinks, which was published in 1853. It's the first known bar manual uh, published in, anywhere in the world. Um, and has lots of great, so in 1863, lot, you know, mid, mid 19th century, lots of, of great recipes. It was really almost lost for a long time. But then when there's this big um, boom of the pre -po pre prohibition cocktail movement back in the, you know, about, about 15, 20 years ago, a lot of bartenders started digging up this, this old bar manual and, and trying to recreate the recipes and it really helped drive the, um, the craft cocktail movement, if you want to call it that, which is really re revolutionized <laughs> how Americans drink in the 21st century. But uh, Jerry ha Thomas had uh, at least eight, and there's actually, I think, a couple more on other pages, recipes for cocktail. You'll see some of them, like the brandy cocktail, is a pretty much a, you know, gum syrup would be a would be a, a form of, of simple syrup. Bogart's another popular brand of bitter, and he would add a, a brandy, and he would add a dash of curacao uh, to, to that one. And you'll see a few other ingredients making its, its way in there. I don't think it was in Thomas's, but absinthe was called for in a lot of these cocktail recipes. So bartenders started fancying it up and it started being you know, used with different types of um, of liquors, different types of um, ingredients to sort of fancy up a cocktail. So much so that cocktail quickly became or gradually became a more generic term for a mixed drink of any sort. Uh, and that's and it has been ever, ever since. So I, we still have, we have cocktail parties now. We aren't necessarily drinking cocktail. So if you're, and this is a, another bar manual from 1888, uh, Theodore Prue. Uh, he had a Manhattan cocktail, it, uh, one of the early versions of the, of the Manhattan, a martini cocktail, metropolitan cocktail. So you see all the cocktails now starting to emerge. In yellow there is the old fashioned cocktail. So today, old fashioned is a cocktail, which one of my go-to drinks in, in fact. But what that really was, was if you went into a bar and now they have all these variations of cocktails and you wanted the one like they used to make in the old days, you'd say, give me an old fashioned cocktail. And you'll see it's, you know, with this one down here, it's pretty much, you know, uh, bitters syrup, uh, it, which would be sugar and, and water and your whiskey or, or your uh, your brandy, whatever you wanted to put into it. Uh, and, it and in uh, Proust's case, he's adding a little dash of, of absinthe to give it a little bit of that, that absinthe flavor. So that is the old fashioned. Um, over time, I mean, in the old fashioned sort of come back into fashion here in the 21st century. You'll typically see it looking like this these days. This is sort of how 21st century bartenders sort of recreate it. They tend to use the big cubes, et, et cetera. And, uh, but in the 20th century, the old fashioned continued to evolve. And this is the brandy old fashioned that you might find up in, especially in Wisconsin, where they still have sugar, tend to use simple syrup, but then they'll take orange and cherry off and they'll muddle it together. And they, they'll they make theirs with, with brandy in, in, in Wisconsin. So the, the old fashioned continued to evolve. And now we have pure syrup going back to this old fashioned. But uh, old fashioned cocktail is, is hearkening back to the, the original, uh, the original old fashioned. So this recipe, this is sort of the basic old fashioned, old, old fashioned recipe. I call it the old fashioned old fashioned because it's going back to the way they're making it in the 19th century, usually using rye whiskey these days. A lot of people will use bourbon, but I would definitely prefer rye. This is Rittenhouse, which is sort of my go-to rye. Um, you can use the one or two sugar cubes. You can uh, put them in a glass. I'll go ahead a little. Last here, you can do that. Add a couple of drops of water. I think I a little water over here. Just enough to, um, let's see, I will, will stop the share so we can make it full size here. So just enough to, you know, muddle it up and, and make a little syrup out of it like that. And then mix in your one and a half or two ounces of rye. I'll do here. Since it is cocktail hour here in Charleston. So I got my rye, whiskey, and my sugar. And then I like to uh, stir it up well and mix it in. I'll usually would muddle that sugar and water a little bit more to, to mix it up, but it won't make you watch me do all that. And then I like to use the big ice cubes. I got my big uh, ice cube tray to get a, a nice big ice cube into it, stir it around. 
and there we go. Here we have an old fashioned, old fashioned, uh, ready, ready to go. So back to the uh, back to the presentation. Robert, quick question. Yeah. So you mentioned the, um, I think it was the bitters drink that was kind of the the start of it um, to some degree, but mm -hmm. also that it was used for medicinal purposes. So I'm curious to if if that kind of goes along. You see it in in movies, and you hear I hear like my grandparents and their friends, uh, like when a baby's sick, they'll say you know take a little bit of a whiskey and rub it on their gums or something like that, or even the phrase grandpa's old medicine cabinet. Like does that kind of stem from that? Kind of genesis yes story. the the world of um recreational beverages and medicinal drinks were very closely intertwined in the 19th century so your bitters were originally marketed um as medicine you're supposed to drink them it has lots of herbs in them you know so it's, it's supposed to settle your stomach uh a cure for indigestion and then over time they took on more and more uh claims for solving everything headaches you know all these gastric issues things that we realize now have absolutely would not be at all at all fixed by it um but i think you still had that use of whiskey as medicinal straight through um the, the 20th century in fact during prohibition there was the carve out that american distillers could still make medicinal whiskey which would be prescribed by doctors for you know for all sorts of things including rubbing on the gums of babies and and things like that and um, if you had a bad case of nerves in the 1920s, you could very easily get a prescription for your doctor for medicinal whiskey. And some people had a really bad case of nerves and had to get a case of whiskey every week to, to, to treat them. Um, but yes, yeah, so there, and patent medicines, which were huge in the 19th century, all the doctor feel goods and all those things. And originally Coca-Cola was a patent medicine with, uh, cocaine in it, along with a lot of other herbs. Um, they, they were very, very intertwined and lots of patent medicines, Really, the secret ingredient was a big base of whiskey or some other alcohol because it will have a sort of anesthetic effect. So it would make you feel better. And then all the herbs make it feel medicinal and sort of gross, which would my, be, uh, make you feel like medicine. My grandmother um, always kept a uh, bottle of peach brandy up in the cabinet. And we always, as kids, would wonder, wow, because she was such a teetotaler. And mm -hmm. she kept it, but that was for medicinal purposes. Yeah, yeah, that was very much the the thing back then. Uh, the, so yeah, the lines between medicine and and, and uh, recreational drinking is, is was very blurry. Uh, in fact, a lot of pharmacists we'll, we'll get to a pharmacist here in a second uh, sold a lot of whiskey and a lot of other alcoholic beverages out of their pharmacies uh, in, in the 19th century. Of course, back then there wasn't a whole lot of other medicines and we didn't have a lot of very effective medicine. A lot of times alcohol was about the most effective thing you could have for aches and pains and, and that type of thing. All right, so we've covered the from the uh, toddy to the julep to the cocktail, at least the 19th century versions of it. Um, but let's talk about the how did we get from those versions to where we were today? We talked a little bit about the old fashioned uh, cocktail. Um, it's always hard for me to remember, even though I sort of steeped in the 19th century, I always have to remind myself how different it was back before the Civil War in particular, when there was no ice available in the South, um, at least not during, maybe during the depths of winter. But the further south you got, you, the lakes wouldn't freeze over, there was no way of getting ice. Um, everything was room temperature all the time. And in the summer, that means everything was 80 degrees or 85, 90 degrees. Uh, and and you just didn't didn't cool off. Um, that's started to change about the 1820s. A little bit before that, people entrepreneurs were experimenting with it, but really wasn't until the 1820s that so they could make a business out of it. And that is the ice trade. And what the, what would, uh, they would do is they would have men like the like shown here up in New England cut giant blocks of ice. Uh, out of the winter, the the lakes at the end of winter or, or, or early in spring before the ice started to melt, uh, and dragging these big blades over them. And then they would put them on ships and sail them down to Charleston, to New Orleans, uh, to Mobile. Um, it eventually by the 1820s, 1830s, most every port city in the South had an ice house, so they would pack these giant blocks of ice in like uh, 
sawdust and other sort of crude forms of insulation, take them to these ice houses, which they built, they tried all kinds of different ways. Problem was that you're, if you're selling ice, your product literally is melting away day after day after day. And so they're trying to insulate it better and better. They finally sort of got it down by, by the 1820s um, so that they could keep a supply of ice most of the way through the summer. Now, it wasn't enough ice that every, it was expensive. Not everybody was going to go, you know, buy a bunch of ice and then you use it in an ice box or anything like that. That came that came later, the ice man with the tongs carrying it. They would go buy ice in the pail, though, and, and take it home. They could use it to cool small things. Um, they uh, One of the first things people did with ice was they made ice cream. If you think about the hand churned ice cream, very much the how they did it. You put a cylinder down in ice, crushed ice, and and churn cream and and or fruits and other things, and you know ice cream became available. Another thing they did with it is they created the hailstorm julep, which is uh, I first came across it in the first references I could find. It was in the Virginia Hot Springs Resorts, which is in the western part of Virginia and some of what is now West Virginia, but in the mountainous area, all of these mineral springs. Originally, they were where people were, again, the um, medicine and, and, and spirits coming together. Um, there were where people would go to take the water, particularly people who had various ailments that, you know, soaking in the hot springs uh, would relieve them if you think of like... Uh, uh, FDR in, in Warm Springs, Georgia. That was very much a uh, you know, early, late, late 18th century, early 19th century. Lots of these little resorts popped up by by the springs. Originally, it was just you would a little bathhouse or something you could change with the spring. Then they got more elaborate hotels, and soon they became not just a, a health retreat, but just a general summertime resort, particularly for wealthy Southerners who would um, head to the mountains when it got hot in. Uh, uh, in Richmond or Charleston and and, and hang out at these uh, resorts. So uh, one of the first thing, one of the things they did when the ice was available is they would crush it up, put it in a big goblet, uh, pour over, if you think of the old julep, you know, the, the sugar and the mint, uh, they would create that, pour it in over the ice and then put straws down into it. And for the first time, straws really became a part of the bartenders trade. And at that time they were literal straws, like, you know, like hay or something with a, with a hollow uh, piece in the middle. And that was the origin of the hailstorm julep. And it was so popular that people actually, I mean, were, wrote these rhapsodic poems about the julep, like how, you know, it, how wonderful it is, which seems sort of silly now, but if you think if you went all summer, it's 95 degrees, you have anything cold to drink, everything's 85 degrees around you, including the water you drink, and then someone handed you this big goblet with, you know, this wonderful sweet brandy with fruit on top and mint and everything else, and you took a sip, you you probably, you know, would be tempted to write a poem as well. So the um, mint julep, or the hailstorm julep, as it was called, because it was like a hailstorm of ice in the glass, really took off in the 1830s and 1840s. Originally, the resort, soon it moved to the cities, um, in particular to Richmond, Virginia. And um, this is uh, John Dabney, who I wrote about a little bit in, in Southern Spirits, one of the great Virginia julep makers. And then I we've got so interested in his story that he really led me into my next book, which is uh, the law or my latest book, which is the Lost Southern Chefs, because he got started working at the Western resorts, including one of these. This is Old Sweet Springs uh, in what is now West Virginia. This is a big uh, illustration from after the Civil War. Uh, Dabby worked there. I don't know if he worked there before the Civil War, but we definitely worked there afterwards. But you can see how elaborate these resorts were. If you think of the Greenbrier in West Virginia, that resort, that is actually one of the legacies of these old uh, these spring, these spring water resorts. Um, so big hotels, gardens. It was really a resort for the for wealthy Southerners uh, in in the nineteenth century, with bathhouses where you could go take the waters if you were so inclined uh, uh, at the, at the hot springs. So Dabney worked, um, got started working there. Probably learned juleps there uh, at about the time that they were emerging. Then he went back to Richmond. Um, his story is absolutely fascinating. I won't be able to go into it in depth, but it's in The Lost Southern Chefs. A very remarkable guy because he was originally, he was, he was born into slavery, uh, worked at these resorts under a practice called uh, hiring out, where an owner would hire out a, a slave person to work um, 
oftentimes at factories, oftentimes other people's plantations. But in, in Dabney's case, it was to work in the resorts, uh, um, to work in, as, as a bartender there and, and a cook. And he later became uh, what's known as a caterer, which he ran basically the whole culinary operations for, for these resorts. But he earned enough money from tips doing this that he was able to purchase his own Actually, he started purchasing his freedom. He worked out a plan, a payment plan with his with his owner. Uh, and then the Civil War came before he finished paying off the debt. And it's a long story there that I go into in the book, but really just a, a remarkable guy. And after the, the Civil War, um, he became the most, well, even, even before the Civil War, he, he established his own uh, his own place in Richmond. But before he did, uh, during the summers, he worked at the resorts. And then he would come back to Richmond along with several other folks like uh, a guy named Jim Cook and his brother Fields Cook. And they worked at the uh, Ballard House and Exchange Hotel, which at the time was Richmond's fanciest hotels. Uh, the one on the right is actually um, the Ballard House, operated by a guy named John Ballard. He bought the building across and created the Exchange Hotel. And he built that little bridge across the street uh, and the two were connected and then and this is another picture of the, they upgraded the bridge a little bit later on of the uh, exchange hotel. So um, John Dabney was sort of ran the bar along with a guy named Jim Cook at the at, at the Ballard House in the, in the exchange hotel uh, and became very famous there for serving juleps. Uh, he served straight through the war with the Civil War, which is amazing. Uh, at the time that Richmond was basically filled with military folks, the whole story is in the uh, in, in the book. Um at some point, I can't remember this. I believe this was, I can't remember this is right after the war, right before the war. I think it was right, right before the Civil War. This is the Prince of Wales, uh, Queen Victoria's son, who did a grand tour of the United States in the um, uh, in the I think 1860. So I think it was right the year before the, the Civil War. Uh, he was apparently a a just uh, a handful. Uh, this he was around 19 years old. I think we made this this tour. He did what most 19 year olds did, which is raise a bunch of hell. Uh, they traveled throughout the, uh, the, the throughout America. I think Queen Victoria was glad to get rid of him, ship him overseas for a year. Uh, he traveled with a whole party of earls and dukes and all these very young, these young nobles from from England. And um, one of the places they visited was. Richmond, Virginia. They stayed in the ex uh, in the Exchange Hotel. They took over that entire hotel uh, across from the Ballard House. And Jim, one of the things that uh, John Dabney and Jim Cook did was they made a gigantic julep uh, for the Prince of Wales and his entourage. Now, I've got this little souvenir glass from the Kentucky Derby or one of the the mint juleps. That's not a, a John Dabney julep. A John Dabney julep was served in a giant silver goblet, probably about the size of my head. And it was a multi-person drink and he would fill it with ice. He had some secret mixture for his julep that was probably based on brandy. Um, but he would then cover it with lots of, well, he bound it up with ice over the top and actually molded a, like a cone of ice sticking out of the top of this thing. And it would stick big straws down in it because it was a multi-person drink, cover it with like all these fruits and designs and ice. So it was really a, a showstopper of a, of a, of a drink. So apparently he and the, um, and Jim Cook, his fellow bartender delivered it across to the, to the prince's um, room, the prince and his, uh, his entourage drank, you know, sipped it and drank it. And they liked it so much. They ordered another one for the next day before they headed out to tour, to tour of Richmond. Um, and that was sort of a, it was a, a bit of a crowning achievement for uh, John Dabney's pre-Civil War career. I won't go into everything that he did afterwards, but he had a really remarkable career afterwards as well. One that was both, uh, he he basically opened his own restaurant. He was one of the most in-demand caterers in Richmond. There's um, sort of a tragic ending to it as well um, the, of what happened. Um, he was with, with, same thing that happened with lots of the African-American bartenders in the South, which is a had a brief period of reconstruction, about 10 years, so they really thrived, and then they were steadily pushed out of the business. Um, and th that's what the the Lost Southern Chefs really goes into a lot of detail about, about what happened to folks like John Dabney afterwards. But we think about the Kentucky Derby, we think about uh, uh, you know, Kentucky as, and bourbon as the uh, original julep. That's not the case at all. It was a brandy drink or a rum drink, primarily. 
up until the till after the Civil War. Um, and John Dabney and the his fellow bartenders in Richmond, Virginia, were the map, you know, put the the hailstorm mint julep on the map. It became very popular in New York uh, and, and all over the United States. In fact, the mint julep was one of the most popular cocktails in the country in the 1870s, 1880s. And John Dabney really helped you know, make that possible. So I have a recipe in the book for an antebellum mint julep. If you want to uh, to take a crack at it, you'll see the book I call for cognac, um, as which was often used. Cognac being brandy from the cognac re region of France in the 19th century was the most prized, most expensive imported brandy. If you wanted to pay for the good stuff, you would bring that in. It's interesting you mentioned peach brandy. The other most popular spirit for juleps in the mid 19th century was peach brandy. I have a bottle of it here. Now this is not what for a long time, well, it's very hard to find real peach brandy these days. Um, most of the things you see peach brandy on the liquor store shelf is gonna be grape brandy that's flavored with peaches. And it's gonna be very sweet and it's not, not gonna be very good. So back in the 19th century, uh, Lots of farmers had stills, and when they had too many peaches, uh, a bumper crop of peaches, they went to the still and they made brandy out of it. Um, down here in Charleston, there's a high wire distilling, is a, a great sort of craft distillery here. I'm friends with the guys there. They um, make once a year, they'll make a run of peach brandy using South Carolina peaches, uh, and they they start with a ton of South Carolina peaches, literally one ton of peaches, and it's a, enough for maybe two or three barrels. And it's a very limited edition. This bottle I have, which I'm not going to open, is number seven of three of 319 bottles that were made from their, their very first run. Uh, I had another bottle, and I can attest, it is fantastic in a mint julep. Um, I recommend anybody who does a mint julep to either use cognac, or this is sort of my go-to, which you can, find, you can find a lot of places. This is uh, Laird's Apple Brandy. There's two different types. There is a uh, Laird's... Uh, old distillery going back to the 19th century one, at one point was about the last uh, American distillery making apple brandy. Their less expensive brandy is neutral spirits that has uh, flavored with apple brandy. This is a actually straight bottled and bond apple brandy. It is distilled from apple cider. They start with apple cider. They let it ferment even more than it normally does with yeast. And then they distill it. It's 100 proof. It's bottled and bond. And it's really tasty and it makes a fantastic uh, mint julep. If we were doing this in person, I would have mixed up a batch <laughs> for everyone. I've done quite a number of events and everybody's blown away by the, the, the mint julep with apple. It has that nice, it's just a very hint of apple. It's not very sweet. It's a, uh, it, it gets distilled, but I would recommend that to anybody for a julep. So how do we get to the Kentucky Derby? So uh, this guy on the left is named Irwin S. Cobb. Uh, he is a Kentucky. It was a Kentucky newspaperman, uh, a very Kentucky partisan. But he went to New York and was one largely forgotten today. But at the time, was one of the most well-known uh, newspapermen and, and storytellers uh, in, in the United States. Um, he was a big advocate for the Kentucky distilling industry uh, in the, the run-up to Prohibition. Wrote a, a book called um, "Red was it Red Liquor," I think he called it. Um, during the during the during prohibition, it was all about how prohibition had killed all these Kentucky distilleries. But he was a big, uh, you know, a, a big partisan for for Kentucky. And um, if you study the history of of cocktails and, and, and alcohol in the the South, or actually in, in the United States, prohibition really threw everything up into the air. And um, it was just great disruption. It almost killed American cocktail culture. Uh, everyone forgot about the old uh, pre-prohibition uh, way of making cocktails, bathtub gin, you know, all the, the things that you associate with prohibition. After you came out of prohibition, you had the distilling industry re trying to restart, right trying to reboot, but they sort of had to go back and like try to you know, re-educate the consumer about how to make cocktails. Irwin S. Cobb, Irvin S. Cobb was a, um, you know, he worked with a lot of the, the the distillers associations. He produced this recipe book. You'll see down at the bottom, it says Dave's Liquor Store. You could actually buy this for, I think, a 10 cents or a nickel at, at the corner liquor store. It's full of recipes trying to teach people how to remake uh, remake juleps. Um, even before 
prohibition ended this is from 1933 uh Cobb they, they were there was like he's running battles in the press um where Irvin S. Irvin S. Cobb was was this is a guy named Eddie of the Astor so Cobb is on the right side Eddie is on the left side uh, they had a a mint julep showdown because uh Eddie of the Astor said that brandy was the proper spirit for a mint julep and, and Cobb said no it's bourbon and so they they had this whole uh, sort of put on uh, competition at, at Cobb's New York apartment. Uh, the guy with the glass to his mouth is a guy named Haywood Brune, another very famous uh, newspaper man back in the 20s and 30s, who has also largely been forgotten. He was the judge. But apparently Cobb uh, invited Eddie the Astor over. Ernest Cobb had a bottle of 1901 bourbon, so a 33-year-old bottle or 31-year-old bottle of bourbon. And he dug around in his cabinet, found some old cheap bottle of brandy and gave it to Eddie. Uh, this is what Eddie claimed later. Uh, Hayward Brune apparently drank uh, one of each, decided he needed to sample again. So he drank another bourbon and another uh, brandy one, and then decided he needed one more round, and then went and laid down, took a nap, and then woke up and declared that uh, Cobb was the winner and that bourbon was the proper spirit. Uh, I like to think it was all Ir Irvin S. Cobb's uh, fault, but really um, in the late 30s, uh, Kentucky, the Kentucky Derby, which had been around since the, the like 1870s, um, started serving mint juleps as their official uh, beverage. And you'll see here, this is, uh, I think 1937 was when it was the first time they did their souvenir glasses. And originally there were souvenir cups, but uh, they, they now do these glasses that you get each year. People have complete sets and all that. And so Kentucky sort of just took over at that point. And, and people associate uh Tulips with bourbon and, and the Kentucky Derby ever since. All right, well, we're about out of time. I'll just want to touch briefly on the Sazerac. Um, I won't go into the story. I have this whole, if you if you want to spend an hour, I can weave this tale of how complicated the history of the Sazerac is. And it involves like all these uh, exchange bars and all these people. But I uh, do want to touch upon well, how did the Sazerac cocktail become the, the Sazerac? Um, this is around the 1850s. You see a brand of cognac brandy in New Orleans called the Sazerac. Uh, this is actually a bottle of it over here. It's from a French uh, cognac maker that's long out of business. It's called Sazerac de Forge et Feel. So um, the Sazerac and his sons. Um, and they were selling in New Orleans in the 1850s vintage like 1793 uh, con cognac there's an ad for it over here including um at this this bar called the well it was run by a lot of different people uh thomas handy took it over on royal street but it was called various things including the the ex exchange uh exchange house uh it eventually became called the sazerac house because one of the featured items there was the sazerac brandy uh, and then it got taken over and there's lots of back and forth. It's very confusing, but you'll see like Vincent Mikas took over the, uh, the exchange from Thomas Handy, Sazerac Brandies. It started becoming called like the Sazerac Bar Room or the Sazerac House, which you'll see in the ads here. So there was a bar there just off of Canal Street uh, that became known as the Sazerac House or the Sazerac Bar. And it became very well known for it's Sazerac brandies. Now, did they take that brandy and make a toddy out of it? Maybe they did, or they are a cocktail out of it. Quite, quite possible. Um, but one of the mysteries is you never see anything called the Sazerac cocktail back before, you know, back in the 1870s. It's not just not called that. You see a lot of Sazerac brandy, and then all of a sudden, uh, cognac and Sazerac is technically a, a cognac because it's from the cognac reason. Uh, cognac fell out of favor at the same time that whiskey uh, started to get better in the United States, uh, thanks to barrel aging and improvement of the distilling industry. And then this little bug called phylloxera hit the vineyards in cognac in the cognac region in France and wiped out the vineyards, wiped out the cognac industry. And um, <laughs> I love this this picture of the little bug uh, drinking all the 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 fine wine and cognac in the cognac reason. But what happened is all the cognac producers no longer had uh, stocks or didn't have enough stocks. A lot of imitations flooded the market and they were really cheap, oftentimes not even real brandy 
just flavored to try to pass itself off as cognac. It fell out of favor in the United States because no one could trust it when they were buying with the good stuff. At the same time, rye whiskey is getting better. And whiskey, get you see a lot of cocktails in the 1880s, 1890s that used to be made with cognac start to be made with rye whiskey in particular, also bourbon, but particularly rye whiskey. Um, at the same time, this is a, a pay show. We talked about the pharmacist. He started producing a lot of bitters somewhere, somewhere in, around the Civil War. And it really took off after the Civil War and became the most popular, uh, one of the most popular bitters in the South. Uh, if you've ever had Peixot bitters, you'll know the unique thing about it is it's, it's bright red color. Uh, Peixot died and it, it passed into the hands of a, guy, of a couple of different hands, but ended up in the hands of Ellie Jung or Jung, who uh, that company is still, its descendants are still making it today. It's gone through a couple of different names, uh, but it's now owned by, uh, I think it's Young and Wolf now that, that owns it. Yeah, in fact, it is. You can see Young and Wolf on the label. So this is pay shows. I happen to be out of it. I don't have a, uh, uh, I don't have a bottle to, to show. So I got grabbed a picture. Still made today. It's just, it's just, unlike most bitters, and you're probably familiar with, if anybody's, if you have a bottle of bitters, it's probably Angostura, which is the single most common bitters. It used to be the only bitters you could find anywhere until the, the, uh, cocktail revolution of about 15 years ago, but it has a unique clove flavor. It's a little, it's a little different flavor. So the Sazerac cocktail came about at some point. There's no reference to it in the, in the, up until like the 1890s, but around 1900, Thomas Handy and company used to own this Sazerac house. Uh, Handy died, but his, his successors who took over the company started producing the bottled Sazerac cocktail. And then they, uh, the Sazerac House became very well known in in New Orleans for, um, you know, for that particular cocktail, that their house cocktail. And then after Prohibition, the Sazerac Company, uh, they lost that building, but they opened another Sazerac House uh, on Canal Street. And then around 1940s, the Roosevelt Hotel uh, bought the rights to it and created the Sazerac Bar. And there's still a Sazerac Bar there today where you can get the Sazerac. I think this is um, the, the Sazerac bar at the, at the hotel. So you'll see that distinctive red color to it. That's because of the bitters, um, the, the Peixot bitters. And so if a cocktail is spirit, sugar, water, plus bitters, then a Sazerac is rye whiskey specifically these days, plus sugar, plus water, plus a specific brand of bitters, Peixot bitters, and then a dash of either uh, absinthe or this, which is herb saint, absinthe without was outlawed in the United States around the turn of the 20th century. And a New Orleans company started producing an absinthe substitute, which has very much the same flavor, but no wormwood, which everyone was convinced was making people turning people insane. Uh, they banned uh, absinthe. You can buy absinthe in the United States again now. And so you'll see some people make Sazeracs with, with absinthe, others still use herb saint. But if you think back to the cock, the, the cocktail recipes, a little drop of absinthe was flavored in with a uh, a real Sazerac or a classic Sazerac. You make it like a cocktail. You muddle up your sugar, drop in bitters, uh, your your Peixot bitters, a little bit of water. Uh, use rye whiskey. But then you take another glass, you rinse it with the herb saint, and then you just rinse it, spin it, and then dump out the remainder because it's really just supposed to coat the glass. It gives this very herbal, licorice-type distinctive flavor. And then you strain the, the cocktail in. So it's really the classic uh, Sazerac emerged from the cocktail. And that's it's sort of an up, uptown version of it. So that's my quick tour uh, from late 18th century to today about how we went, uh, how the cocktail came to be and how the, the Sazerac and the mint julep uh, descend or evolved uh, over, over the course of the decades. I did want to also pitch, uh, I have another book out, uh, Part called Barbecue, the History of American Institution. Very popular gift, uh, Christmas gift if you're stuck for somebody who loves barbecue. Uh, it does for barbecue what I did for Cocktails with Southern Spirits, which is tell the story from the colonial era straight up till, till today. So I'll Robert, thank you so much. Man. Answer questions. Uh, yeah, any, um, any questions? I did have one. I'm just curious what 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 sparked your interest in in spirits and, and I guess kind of food as well? It seems like the, I guess you kind of talked about you know kind of your uh, inspiration to 
your journey into this, uh, the Lost Southern Chefs what kind of started, I guess, in the Southern Spirits journey um, as you were doing that. But what kind of yeah. started you on that path? Well, I fin- yeah, well, I finished up uh, at Furman in 90- 1992 and then went down to Columbia. Uh, and uh, I was an English major at Furman. So I rolled into English graduate school down there, not knowing what I wanted to do with myself. Uh, I got a master's and uh, still didn't want to know, know what I wanted to do with myself, but was enjoying it. So I stuck around. I got a PhD uh, at, at USC. Um, I studied 20th century American lit- literature and I wrote about Raymond Chandler, the, the detective novel for my dissertation. But in the process, I think if I did it over again, I probably would have gotten a PhD in history because I got much more interested in history while I was um, studying American literature. And particularly, I was really grounding early 20th century novels in the historical context and really learning a lot about about the history. Uh, also, sort of got interested in food around the same time and uh, always had liked barbecue and eating that. And so this barbecue book, the, what you see in the middle there is actually the revised and expanded edition. That was my first uh, non-academic book or a non, non, non-literature non book that, that I did. Um, the original version came out in 2010. So after I finished up my dissertation at, at, at South Carolina, I was like, you know, I was really getting into food history. I was really getting into, uh, I really enjoyed eating barbecue. So I'm going to go to the library and read about a book about barbecue history and went to the USC library and was surprised to find there really was no book that had been written about the history of barbecue. Um, and I dug into it. I mean, there, there was like, most books had like a page or two maybe of history, a little bit written about like history of restaurants of the 20th century, but almost nothing about the 19th century. So that took me back into 19th century barbecue history, which took me into 19th century uh, culinary history in general. And then along the way, I started writing about, you know, back into early days of blogs, uh, restaurants and things like that, especially after I moved to Charleston. Um, I got uh, just a side gig at the Charleston City Paper down here as their restaurant critic. I uh, started writing about restaurants. I don't even somehow I came. I, I got to know the editors from Southern Living. They asked me to come on board and write about barbecue for them. And so I've always had to, uh, since then had this sort of split between writing about current day restaurants, but then writing a lot about the history. So barbecue actually led me to some of the figures in the Lost Southern Chefs as well, um, uncovering some of these 19th century, particularly the uh, uh, the black cooks from the 19th century who had been totally forgotten. And, and sort of written out of the story. And they didn't make it into the first edition of Barbecue because I just didn't, I couldn't even find out any information about them. I dug deeper and deeper. In the second issue, I was able to, edition, I was able to really write about uh, them. And those figures led me into um, a lot of the other, other pieces as well. Um, all the books sort of came about by me digging into things and realizing no one's ever really written about this before. So the story of spirits in the 19th century, particularly Southern drinking, at the time I was working on it, it was all about bourbon and mint juleps. Now that was about it. About it. You know, That's about the extent that people really knew much about the uh, drinking in the South. And so that led me into that. Same thing with Lost Southern Chefs. Um, I start, kept finding these remarkable people, but no one had really much written much about restaurants in the 19th century South. In fact, most of the stories, if you read read most of the existing books, you would think there were no restaurants in the South until you know after World War II. Uh, it's not at all the case. There, there's quite a long story there. So usually I, I get into it. It's long, long winded way of answering just Justin, but I, I got into it because I led down a path and realized no one had really written about it. Dug more and more into it and then realized you know I had a book on each of these each of these topics. Heidi chimed in uh, in the chat and asked, this is actually a question I was interested in as well. What uh, What's your next book? Ah, my next book. So um, my next book is actually already uh, at the publisher. And uh, it is, this is not it, but this is a, a little book called, the. this is called the Cafe Brillo. LSU Press is doing this little series of mini books, as they call them. They're about 20,000 words. This one's about 80 pages. Mine will be probably about the same when it's published in a small for 80 small pages. Uh, but it's on this, this book, uh, a series is called the iconic New Orleans cocktails. And so they have one little book about each of the classic cocktails. Uh, somebody else is already doing the Sazerac. So I, I can't do that. I'm doing the Raffinac, which is a cocktail that I guarantee no one's has, has even heard of. Uh, it was a very famous cocktail um uh, around 1900 
anybody who visited New Orleans would talk about the Sazerac, the Ramos Gin Fizz, and the Raffinac as sort of the great the great classic drinks of New Orleans or New Orleans contributions. It disappeared almost without a trace after pro, uh, prohibition, but it has a crazy story, which I, I, I you, you, you have to read the story to, to really get into it. It, it did. It's a, a completely unexpected story. So the next one is, um, is a Raffinac that's already off to the press. It should come out in the fall of next year. Those uh, move slowly. And I don't know after that, I've been sort of messing with uh, the history of American whiskey another area where most everyone who's written about uh, American whiskey starts in Kentucky with bourbon and everything's so focused on bourbon. Uh, and I love bourbon. I love Kentucky. I was, uh, I love going up there and, and touring it, but there's so much more to the history of American whiskey, including lots of Pennsylvania uh, and Maryland, believe it or not, Ohio, Indiana uh, really played a huge role in, the 19th century, the development of the, of the whiskey industry. So that may be, I don't know, I don't have a publisher for that one yet, but I've been researching a lot. So both of them, both of the next ones are probably gonna be in the in the spirits realm. Thank you very much. This was great. I enjoyed it oh, a lot. I'm you. enjoying reading the book. I'm about halfway through and look forward to finishing it up. Oh, oh great. Well, I'm glad to get the book and yeah, I love talking about this stuff. So thanks for, for, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Robert. That was so interesting. And I'm going to have to buy the books. So <laughs> that's my next purchase. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, I can absolutely say the Lost Southern Chefs, I just I wrote it down is on my list. So uh, I'll be getting that Amazon order soon. Um, so good. Well, Robert, uh, we really do appreciate you and appreciate you guys uh, joining us uh, this evening. And um Looking forward to uh, your future published books and looking forward to diving into the ones you've already done. I will ask one last question uh, that my, that's uh, sparked my curiosity. After writing the books, are you a better barbecue person or a better cocktail maker? Which one has enhanced mm. your skills better? Um, That's a tough, that's a tough. I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm a pretty good amateur at both. I would not compete with uh, either a professional bartender or I have lots of friends in the barbecue world who are great, you know, true pit masters. I, I can't compete with them. I would say I'm about equal with both, but still just a accomplished amateur, not a, not a pro at, at either one. There you go. Well, Robert, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you giving, giving your time uh, this evening, yeah, sure sharing, um, sharing your works with us. So um, thank you everybody for joining in and uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, on our next sessions. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.